Hello and welcome everyone to the 79th official episode of Unit Corner Club Live. I have a wonderful guest for you today, Ernst Venziel, Conscious Caracal of Afroform. Uh, he'll be here to speak to us today about taking our fate into our own hands and building the future that we want to have. So before we get started, like I do at the beginning of all of my streams, thank you to the wonderful people who support this channel monthly over on Subscribestar. Uh, for even a dollar a month, you can get your name featured here at the beginning of my streams and the ending of all of my uh, pre-recorded videos. During the stream today, uh, you can send in your questions uh, to both me and my um, illustrious guest, Ernst. Uh, on Entropy, Cash App, Subscribestar, PayPal, Hyper Chats on Odyssey, and Rumble Chats on Rumble. Um, we will be taking those questions here in about 50 minutes before we wrap up and get out of here. Uh, we have, of course, Ernst for one hour. He and I both are very busy and have things to do today, so we have to keep things moving. And speaking of getting things moving, we are going to bring on my wonderful guest, Ernst. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, uh, did I say your name correctly, Ernst Von Ziel? Yes, that's uh, that's hundred percent. But I'm also not very picky about uh, how my uh, my name is pronounced or any okay. of those things. But yeah, just to uh, uh, disclose to your audience, uh, we are not late because of uh, it's not Yiz's fault. It's uh, absolutely mine. I'm just very busy this morning. It's been a hurricane uh, on my side in regards to meetings and stuff that uh, I had to get done. But yeah, here we are, and I'm I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, um, while while I make sure all the streams are working and I get all the shilling done in the chat for you and I both, uh, how about you take a few minutes and just tell my audience uh, who you are and why you are the public face uh, that you are today. Give us a little introduction to you, the man, and why you are publicly who you are now. Hmm. Well, uh uh, it's nice to be back on on your stream, but uh, I'll definitely give uh, your audience another introduction, just very short, to who I am. So, uh, my name is Adams Van Sale. I work for Afri Forum. I uh, have a, a master's degree in political science, uh, specifically focusing on uh, totalitarian leftist regimes and how they interact with uh, property rights, specifically. Um, and then also at Afri Forum, my focus is I'm a campaigns officer for strategy and content. So my responsibility is to identify campaigns, to identify issues and uh, to build uh, solutions around them. So I'm, uh, I'm working in the solutions industry. I'm somewhat of a solutions engineer. And uh, that's what's keeping me so busy. That's why I'm running around. That's why I'm uh, not... Uh, not don't have a lot of free time that's why um I'm, I'm a little bit late to to some things is because i'm just uh, constantly working within uh, a de-developing country on solutions to stop the rot and the solutions to build damn walls uh, against the the rising tide um it's uh, it's been nearly uh what two full years since we've spoken on my channel i believe it's been quite some time mm. You know, my memory is very bad. It was. It's probably. It was somewhere last year. I remember it was. Oh, was it, uh, last year? it wasn't two years. Yeah. It wasn't quite two years. Yeah. Uh, it mm. feels like two years here with all I've been up to, <laughs> and I know that you're no different. Um, speaking yeah. of the work that you do, um, uh, the work that you mentioned, is it entirely with Afroform, or do you work with other organizations as well? Hmm. Now I'm I'm fully employed by AfriForum and I've been working for the organization since uh, 2019. So I, I'm my uh, my attention is not split between uh, different focuses or between different organizations. I'm specifically yeah, there's our websites. I uh, my entire focus is on uh, on AfriForum. My YouTube channel is just my hobby. I don't okay. get paid for what I do there or my Twitter account as well. That's just uh, that's just my personal. A hobby and the things that I like doing is also the, the things that I do at work correlate a lot with the things that I do in my free time as well. And that's getting people organized, helping communities and helping people build a future rather than just sit at home and complain or focus on things that don't matter. Yeah, exactly. That's what I try to do too in my life. Um, mm. The things that I wanted to talk about today specifically are what you can advise people like me and the people that I will advise here in America Today, I would like you to talk to us about the first steps we can take to organize, to build something like Afroforum here, mm. because you have a lot of people in America right now talking about building their own little Arrhenias, uh, building their own mm. little groups of things, uh, their own little protectorates and stuff. But it's just talk. I don't see hardly mm. anyone actually putting down the legwork to have 
not just the social and and uh, economic breathing room to build such a thing, but you have to have a social network of dozens, if not hundreds of like minded people working together on the same project or it doesn't happen. So yeah. since you've been working with people who actually are making it happen and doing great things, not just big picture stuff like in the courts and with legal battles that Af reform does, but also helping people network together and build the what they need to get started with having real protected communities that can thrive. So uh, what would be something that you would advise me first uh, for, mm. for people to take the steps necessary to build something like Afroform here in, in Appalachia or somewhere else in America? Right. I think I'm going to start off first with a quote from one of my good friends, uh, Russell Lamberti, who said, um, nobody's going to just hand you or give you a lovely political order. You're going to have to build it and do it yourself. Unfortunately, uh, I'm not here to sell candy to people. I'm here to sell medicine. Uh, the, it would have been much easier if I was here to tell you a nice story about how easy it is to build a future and how easy it is to get organized in reality. And the, the, the truth is it's not. It's incredibly difficult. And it's something that takes very long. That's how I was raised. My, my parents raised me with the principle that if you're going to do something, you better do it right. Otherwise, you don't do it at all. Right. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that uh, just want to do something, but without a clear plan, without the patience to do it properly, piece by piece. They want it tomorrow. They want it this week. They need a solution now. Well, then you're not going to get a solution because workable, sustainable solutions don't work like that. They're, they're things that you build up over time. You can talk to me about how urgent, urgently we need a solution until you're blue in the face. That's That doesn't matter. What matters is what can we realistically do. Exactly. That's what, what you need to be focusing on. And how did organizations like AfriForum start or how did a place like Urania start? With a very small group of people that just kept persistently building towards a future and building towards something. Urania didn't start yesterday. Urania started in 1991. That's mm -hmm. 30, more than 30 years ago. It's a it's a three decades long project at this point. AfriForum didn't start yesterday. AfriForum started in 2006. That's mm -hmm. also now almost a two decade long uh, project. You're going to have to be ready to uh, uh, start a project that is going to take long and it's going to take a lot of determination. You're not, and, and like I said, I wish I was here to tell a beautiful story. I wish I was here to tell you, here's how you get a solution tomorrow. Here's how you build a future tomorrow. Here's how you fix all of this by next year. That's how politicians speak. Politicians tell you in this election, if we win this election, then everything's going to be fine. If, if you just vote correctly this time, everything's going to be fine. But that's not how reality works. Reality is about people that are willing to... Uh, um, devote their time and energy towards something bigger than themselves that is going to take a long while. But if you do it right, you're going to be building something that's sustainable and something that's going to last generations into the future. But mm -hmm. um, that also takes a certain type of person to build that thing. And that certain type of person is the person that is determined enough to see it through to the end. Like I started this answer with, that, that, that way that my parents raised me, if you're going to do something, you better do it right. Otherwise, you, it's no not even worth it doing it at all. It reminds me of two phrases that we have here uh, in America. You, you might have heard them since you're familiar with English. Uh, one of them is kind of funny. So I'll start with that one. Mm -hmm. And uh oh, well, I already forgot because it happened early in, in early in what you were saying. But the thing that, that actually matters is one of the things I was raised on, one of the, the aphorisms is you have to be willing to plant trees that you'll never know the shade of. And that's what you're talking about. And that's what I talk about to others and try to inspire people here is you have to realize politicians want, they, they, they make you empty promises and they, they act like they have magic powers to wave their government wand and fix everything. Then you have childish people, petulant people, who want to either burn it all down or point their finger at a different group, whether they be a religious group or a different racial group, and they try to blame everything on them. And, and, and they say, oh, well, if we just make people hate them, then things will be OK. And to me, that's the same level of childish lies. It's th the only thing that's going to make us have a good future is people putting in the work and dedicating their lives or at least large portions of their lives to creating positive community that can be upheld and given to people that come after you. And that's what I'm trying to build here in Appalachia. It's still slow going. People here are still very comfortable. They, they believe that they can just vote their way out of this and it will all get fixed. 
And I, I don't have that hope anymore. I, I don't think that that's going to come. I, I think that if you rely on a big government to, to create prosperity for your offspring, I think that's a long wait for a ship that will never dock. <laughs> mm, absolutely. And uh, I recently wrote an opinion piece for a South African publication called uh, Don't Kneel with the Idolaters of the Act. And it's not my own idea. The Idolaters of the Act is a, an idea from a, probably the greatest Afrikaner philosopher that ever lived, Empia van Weyck mm -hmm. And he wrote specifically a warning about the Idolaters of the, of the Act 75 years ago. Um, already these people existed. So the Idolaters of the Act are the people that, and this might sound familiar from the COVID times, just do something. Something needs to be done. At yeah. least they're doing something. That's not, that's not uh, a healthy way of looking at solutions. I mean, you have to ask the question, are they doing the right thing? Not are they doing something? Yes. Uh, in Afrikaans, we have a saying uh, uh, that uh, probably transcends culture that goes, uh, it's better to do nothing than to do something stupid. And yeah. that's, that's very <laughs> important. Uh, it, it, you can't live your life or have a movement with the philosophy of we just need to do something or, at, or defending someone just because they're doing something. What if that thing that they're doing is destructive? What if that thing that yeah. they're doing is stupid? What if that thing that they're doing is only focused on the short term, not the long term? Right. Then it's better to do nothing than to do the wrong thing or to do something that is destined to fail. Pumping yeah. all that passion and uh, resolve and determination in the wrong way is more destructive than first pausing and, and thinking what needs to be done and how we're going to achieve it. So I think in America, just as in South Africa, among the Afrikaners specifically, we need to be very careful of the idolaters of the act. The people that say at least just do something, do something. And yeah, give even me money more. or vote for him and everything will be better. You should avoid those people because they're yeah. not, they're not just dumb, they're destructive, like you said. Mm. They will lead you down a path of ruin. Mm. And specifically, and the, here's where it gets a little bit more dark, is the variant of those idolaters of the act that, that uh, incite or specifically support violence or illegal action. You need to be very careful of those people. Firstly, they probably glow in the dark. And secondly, they, they, they're probably leading you to ruin. Uh, those people have existed for a long the, those idolaters of the act that specifically uh, advocate uh, violent or destructive action mm -hmm. they've existed for long for for decades they've existed for centuries but for centuries and throughout human history what they've done is they've only achieved one thing and that is many young men and women either in coffins or in jail cells that's the it's only very thing. sad that's but it's fruit. true we it's see it in America here, too, because when you look at the idolater of the act, Donald Trump comes to mind. He is the mm -hmm. one that sold all kinds of lies to uh, Americans all across the country about what he was going to do. And then when it came time to lead his great protest and, and all of this stuff, where was he? Where was his millions of dollars? The, these people that stood for him, many of them are still in prison now. And it's just mm -hmm. these idolaters of the act will Pied Piper people to ruin. And that's why I want to build a different way. I want to wean people off of politics. I want to wean people away from chasing uh, cultural leaders on social media like Nick Fuentes or, or some of the darker characters. And I want people to start taking responsibility and building around them and doing what is necessary because people like you and I that, that understand what life should be about – we want, it's not just a race thing, it's an ethnicity thing, because an Englishman is different from an Afrikaner, is different from someone from Finland, is different from someone from Canada. And so I think that creating protectorate groups and factions like Afroforum that are ethnic focused instead of racial focused, I think that's important because the things that matter to us are art, culture, tradition, religion, uh, our language, the people that we have in our lives, the customs that we've cultivated all these years. And we have to keep that positive light on our own groups. And we can acknowledge, you know, racial solidarity, but to build something that people will fight and die for, it's the ethnic identity that really matters. Because here in Appalachia, well, yeah, we're European by race group, but it's our sayings, it's our banjo music, it's our dancing together, it's going camping and deer hunting and the way that we have church together, the kind of music that we do. That's You're not important. Californians. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and so I think that, um, now I might be wrong here, I don't know if you agree with this, but I think that when you want people to organize on positive moral things, 
the focus I don't think should be as much on race as it should be on protecting and creating prosperity for your your ethnic group, like the Afrikaners, for example, mm-hmm. um, because they have created success for the Afrikaners and hopefully all the good people in South Africa. And it has a focus on the Afrikaners and the history of South Africa. And so that's what I want to engender in the things that I build here. So Mm -hmm. when it comes to where the rubber meets the road, when Afroform got off the ground and started becoming strong in what it's doing in in the late aughts and early early teens, um, were you part of it then yet? Or did you not join up till years later? No, I was very young at the time. Uh, I only joined in uh, 2019. Um, okay. So I've been I've been working for the organization for about four years now. Okay. And yeah, for me, the, the the important thing, just to add there to what you were saying, I think something else that's that's very important to remember when it comes to specifically building these resilient uh, centers of order is that they don't discriminate in regards to creating prosperity so for example when afri forum fills potholes or has a neighborhood watch somewhere where there's a lot of members of afri forum everyone in that community benefits from specifically those services that are being provided potholes Mm -hmm. is the best example a pothole doesn't discriminate in the way that when someone drives over it it asks the driver of the vehicle are you an afri forum member or not Uh, and if they say no then the pothole opens and the car falls in it Right. That's not how it works. So you create little centers of order. You create little oases of order within the desert of disorder. But that doesn't mean that you're only serving the people specifically uh, that are, that helped create that order. You're, you're creating a, a growing circle of order and prosperity that everyone benefits from and buys into uh, in mm-hmm. the end within that uh, within that area. But it starts very small. It starts a, with a street. Then it expands to a neighborhood then it expands to a town or a larger or a suburb and that's what people need to remember when uh, when uh, when setting out these or, or uh, embarking on these types of projects is that it's it's incredibly easy to justify to anyone when you start it i mean you you just show them the results and the fruits of what you're creating you're not just creating services and law and order for the people within your organization. You're creating it within a larger and larger circle. You're creating a larger and larger circle or center of order, which is a a very noble cause. It also gives a a very strong moral backbone to your project, which is very important. You need to be able to morally justify what you're doing. Without Mm -hmm. that moral justification, you're not going to be able to motivate and inspire people to really dedicate their lives to the project. That's That's one of the key things is you need that moral justification and backbone for your project. And like I said, uh, just to conclude, creating these centers of order where things work and where state decay, where there are walls being built against state decay creates a very strong moral foundation for you because it serves everyone within that community, whether they be part of the neighborhood watch or not. Uh Uh-huh. I I totally agree with you that morality and having the noble mind of what you're doing is important. Keeping the focus on positivity and, and like you said, order, doing things that are good for you and everyone that's involved in your area or what you're trying to build. So when it comes to advice on people like me or anyone listening here that wants to take action in their local area to build this, who should they talk to first? Uh, mm. How should they organize and what should should they say to people? Let's talk about those three things. Mm. Uh, anything come to mind first? Well, first, again, like I said, I'm here to sell medicine, not candy. And the, the medicine ah. that I'm here to sell you is that you're not going to have an, uh, you're not going to create an organization overnight. Your mission needs to be to create a team. What is a team? A team is literally a minimum of two people getting together to work towards something bigger than themselves. That's step one. If you can't even unite two people uh, uh, towards a common cause, then your cause might not be uh, what what might not never might never manifest. So start off with a team of two people. Find one like minded person in your community that you can work with to start this project. Step two, find a third person. Step four, find a fourth person. Step five, find a sixth, fifth or sixth person. You build it one person at a time, and then you start challenging those people to also go out and find people to 
support your cause. And you start coalescing around one central point. But that's how it started. AfriForum started with three people. And the membership of AfriForum was those three people and their friends and family. And it branched out and it expanded from there. So you're going to have to firstly be willing to take a risk, to risk failure, to risk your plan not working out. And secondly, you're going to have to be willing to start small and humble and not just have a massive organization or a massive supporter base from day one. You are going to have to be willing to struggle and drudge for three, four, five years where pro uh, progress, almost your pro progress, you can't even see any progress being made, but you know you're doing the right thing. And you can see slowly, even if your project, uh, your progress is happening inch by inch, at least something is happening that you're going to have to be willing to endure that initial period where things are going to be very slow and at the snail's pace. But if you can outlast that, if you can get through that initial period where you start building the momentum, your organization is going to start taking on a life of its own. And then things are going to get easier and easier. New challenges are going to come to the fore. But many people fail within that initial phase. They can't break through. It's like, ugh, it might not be the best example, but it's like, quitting smoking the first first three or four days or first week is the hardest but if you get through that then yeah. you break almost you break through a, a seal you break through a, a a wall and then you start gaining momentum and it's exactly it's the like same when i weaned myself movement. off of bad american food it was hard for the first <laughs> few weeks because i craved it but then mm. once i got used to not having potato chips and fast food and soda mm. after a while i didn't even crave them anymore and when i taste them they taste weird so it, yeah. it weaning myself off of bad food was like that um same with sugar yeah <laughs> so when it comes to the things that a small group of two three four people for mm. people listening to this they probably are not part of a large group yet they probably are not even part of any group yet most of us aren't i'm only part of a group tacitly. I don't have around me where I live a formalized group yet. There's a couple of guys I talk to who are sympathetic to starting something, but they're fathers. They have families. They don't have a lot of time or a lot of desire to build the kind of things I want to build. So mm -hmm. let's say that people out there are just getting started. They, they have a handful of people that mm -hmm. want to build something. So let's talk about what they should start with. Do mm -hmm. you think they should start with approaching people that want to make a difference in local schools or repair local infrastructure like the potholes and things. What do you think some of the best things that a small group of people can mm. start doing that will give them not just the, the self-respect and, and proving to themselves they can get things done, but that will also attract others to a small group of things or to a small group that's doing positive things. What are some things that small groups should start with? Right. The most important thing, and this is, absolutely critical is that you have to identify achievable goals i mean if you're going to set yourself up if you're going to say well uh we're going to completely solve the crime problem in our community but you're just two people or we're going to repair this bridge but you're only one or three or four people you're setting yourself up for failure and then your project is never going to get off the ground you identify problems within your community first and then you identify within that range of problems, you identify the ones that you can solve with, within your capacity. So, for example, let's say you've got five people organized. What can five people do? Well, they can't repair a bridge. They uh, probably can't uh, really lobby uh, within a, a, a political sense. They can't, uh, they can't really make a massive impact. But what they can do is they can, if they live in the same street or in the same neighborhood, is they can identify one day a month or one day uh, within a workable time frame where they're going to pick up all the rubbish or all the, the, the garbage laying around if that is a problem within your neighborhood. If your neighbor doesn't have enough trees or doesn't have enough beauty within it, you can plant trees. You can pull your money. I mean, trees aren't expensive. You plant some cheap trees that are beautiful, that mm -hmm. aren't uh, top of the range exotic trees if you don't have all the funds. You plant some trees. If that's one of the achievable goals to if your mission is to beautify your community. Another thing you can do, if your children, for example, go to the same school, 
you can organize and say, well, we are going to attend all the parent teacher meetings or all the uh, meetings of the, the, the parents body within the, within the school. I don't know exactly what the, how parents organize within schools in the United States and South Africa have like a parent. It's different body. state to state, but it usually has mm. the acronym PTA for parent teacher association or some mm. variation thereof. Yeah. It's so exactly you organize, what you're about. you organize those five or six people that you've been able to get together and you say, this is what we want to lobby within that organization or within that body. We're going to stand up for this or stand against this. So you identify firstly the whole range of problems within your community and then within that you, you sift through and you find all the problems that you've identified that are within your capacity to solve and you start doing that. Once you, you grow with more people, once people see what you're doing and see the successes of what you're doing, your capacity is going to grow because more people are going to join you, more people are going to support you, and then you can widen that range of focus and uh, attempt more brave, or more bold, or more uh, impactful things. But you start off small. I mean, Afri Forum started with very small things. Now, today, we, for example, have hundred uh, more than 160 neighborhood watches all across the country. We plant uh, thousands of trees every year. We fill thousands of potholes every year. But when we started off, we planted, for example, five trees or filled 10 potholes or had one neighborhood watch. You start off with what can you do within your capacity, and then you do that exceptionally well. And then from that, you build from work from realistic victory to realistic victory, rather than setting yourself up for failure from the start. Don't uh, don't be an idolater of the act. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. Uh, the advice there is good. Uh, Ernst is saying that we have to start with achievable goals. Look at things that in your community where you live, is there a problem with people that are teaching your children ugly things and you want to do something about that? Is there a problem with damaged infrastructure that you can do something about? Is there a problem with maybe, uh, maybe you're a very avid church goer, like a lot of the people are here, and there are a couple of, of problems in your church that you want to fix? Well, you and just two or three people can show up every Sunday and every Wednesday to Bible study and talk about that problem in a mm -hmm. constructive, moral way, and just a couple of voices at a time is how you start getting uh, is how you start getting attention on what you're wanting to build, which is what what Ernst and I both want, which is a positive moral framework through which we can thrive and have a healthy uh, culture mm. and civilization. And that starts on the small. It starts with us because we can't wait for governments and corporations to give us that because they spoiler they're not ever going to do that. <laughs> we have to build that ourselves. Spoiler: They don't care about you. Yeah, they don't. It's very yeah. true. And, and uh, I mean, I this is a, that, uh, that, that's oh, a good, excuse me. go ahead. Sorry. No, uh, finish your thought, please. Oh, I was going to say uh, when it comes to other things that you can start doing on the small scale, hmm. let's talk now about how to talk to others that show interest hmm. in the little things you're doing, because a big barrier that a lot of people that I talk to have is they are scared that they're going to be infiltrated or they just are hmm. scared to put themselves out there. Because hmm. in the climate that we live in in the United States here, and I'm sure that it's bad in South Africa too, you have a very negative element constantly around you all the time that wants to, to, to paint you as a racist or a white supremacist and all this other stuff. When you try to build anything that, that in some way hmm. benefits white folks. And so there's a lot of people I talk to that that is a barrier for them because they're worried about putting themselves out there and attracting people that will get them in trouble or make them lose their job and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So obviously you and I both agree that you speak morally, you don't poo poo and point the finger at other races and make fun of people and say that this group's the problem, that group's the problem. That's obviously wrong. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the positive things that you can say to others to, to make mm -hmm. yourself look like the good guy and to attract them to, to join what you're doing Give me some advice and give my listeners some advice of what yeah. you think you should say to others to make them get on board once you have their attention with what you're doing. Yeah, no, exactly. That's a, a big problem is uh, people are very easily pressured by uh, the, the commentariat in their country that call them all types of un, uh, unjustified labels and cruel names. But here's the thing. So firstly, just a final thought there that I just remembered in regards to having an impact in your community and within organizations like churches and schools. 
this model is not new. What I'm describing is how leftists infiltrate and pretty much take over organizations, churches, yep. schools. They go to the meetings that nobody wants to go to and make sure there's enough of them organized there that they can set the agenda. And before you know it, they've taken over the entire school. They've taken over the entire church, not by subverting it like through, I don't know, some CIA tactics. They just show up to the meetings and to the agenda setting uh, uh opportunities that everyone else is too lazy to go to the squeaky wheel doing, gets the grease <laughs> absolutely and i mean in the universities in south africa it's the best example so the eff is a minority far left uh, uh, marxist leninist party but they absolutely dominate uh, student councils at on almost all university campuses because they they all go vote in the student council elections that all the other students are just too lazy to go vote in so they end up, they're a tiny 10% party, but they control almost every student council on, on in the country, which means they can set the agenda on every campus in the country. You just have to, I mean, what I'm saying is not like go do the things that, that feel nice. You do the things that need to be done. You go to that boring meeting. You go to that uh, uh, boring agenda setting uh, opportunity that nobody wants to go to because they've got better things to do. No, you go there and make, and you don't need a lot of people to start setting the agenda there. Leftists understand this concept very, very well, and they do it exceptionally well. Um, and you don't need a lot of people. You just need four or five people that get together and say, this is the our mission. This is what we're going to achieve. So when it to comes get to, to your... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, just to uh, uh, to to answer because I've 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 not answered your question yet. Uh, how do you how do you talk to people about getting them involved uh, when they're worried about how they might be attacked or smeared or whatever? Mm -hmm. Very simple. You show them what you want to achieve. You talk very clearly about this is our mission. This is what we want to achieve. But you talk on a scale again that's realistic. You don't say we are going to save the country or we're going to turn the country around. Like no. We are not happy or satisfied with the direction that our school is going, that our church is going, or that our neighborhood is going, and we're going to improve it. And then you improve it through small things like removing graffiti, planting trees, picking up litter and garbage. And then you dare anyone to tell you that all those things are evil or those things are in any way hurting anyone or taking anything away from anyone or malicious in any, any way. As long as your your actions are pure and the actions that you're taking, uh, your actions are grounded in a, in, a, in a solid moral code and what you're doing is justifiable and you can justify what you're doing, people can't touch you. And the other thing is what's also very important is you have to have a strong sense of identity in your organization in regards to what you want to achieve. So when you start off from the beginning of your organization, you need to know what you are and what you want to achieve. So what are you? Are you? What do you want to achieve? Do you want to achieve safer neighborhoods, cleaner neighborhoods, um, better schools, uh, uh, more uh, uh, morally just churches? You identify your mission, but then you stick to that mission and those principles. So when anyone says, "Ugh, they can call you," I, my my colleague Aaron Roots has great has great advice when it comes to this. You never repeat the propaganda of your enemy. So when they call you X, Y, or Z, you don't say some people call me X, Y, and Z. You're amplifying what they're saying. You don't right. repeat the propaganda of your enemies. Right. So that's why I'm not going to do it. So when people say, oh, you're a X, Y, Z, or you're an A, B, C, you just say, no, I know yeah. here. I know what I am. You can't and tell you me what, I, what I am. you step over it. You don't even acknowledge it yeah. and you don't give you don't, it power. You don't go on the defense. If you utilize say, no, their I... terminology, you legitimize their ideology. So you mm. just step over the terms and don't even use them. Yeah. And don't go on the defensive. Don't say, no, I'm not because X, Y, Z. Like, no, I know I'm not that. Uh, you have the burden of proof, seeing as you're calling me this. If you can you can try to to prove that I'm, that I'm this thing, I know that I'm not, so you're going to fail. I'm mm -hmm. going to keep doing what I'm doing unless you you bring some destructive level of evidence uh, i'm waiting uh, otherwise there's no burden of proof on me you just you just short circuit them in that way you keep doing what you're doing and like i said as long as you know that what you're doing is has a strong moral base and you, that you are morally justified in what you're doing they can call you whatever they want you know what you are it's when you start doubting who you are if you start doubting your mission if you're not sure about your moral foundations that you're standing on that your enemies can tell you what you are and start making you doubt yourself but if okay. you know from the beginning this is my mission this is what we're, this is how we're going to do it and this is what this is what we stand for these are our core principles that we are not going to pr uh, compromise on 
They can call you all types of names until they're blue in the face. It doesn't have any effect on you mor uh, morale-wise. That's, that's my best advice in that regard. Okay, then uh, I'm going to remind everyone, uh, here in about 12 minutes, uh, we will be taking community engagement. So I'm going to go ahead and put up the reminder mm. banner uh, to get in your uh, paid chats, get in your entropy questions, get in your rumbles, your odysseys, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, we only have Ernst for about another 20 to 25 minutes, and uh, then we both have to go. Um, so I'm putting up the reminder now, and we will handle those at the end of the stream. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is when you organize with others, you have to have communication and you have to mm -hmm. schedule things. Even if it's just three people, you have to be in communication and you have to make plans. So in, in the climate that we live in, where phone calls sometimes can't go through, sometimes people lose internet. It's, I think that it's important to have multiple layers of connection with the people that you talk to. So if you're organizing with people, they, they need to be real to each other. You have to meet in person. You have to do stuff together in person. You have to contact each other, email, telephone, that kind of thing. So mm. Ernst, when it comes to how to keep in touch and how to schedule things together with a small group of people, Tell me some advice that has worked for you or some things that you know personally work for others when it comes to communication and scheduling these kind of things. Hmm. Well, the, the first step, if it's possible, uh, real world communication is always better than digital, but it's not mm -hmm. always possible. If you can meet up with those people in your community in person and you can decide what is on our agenda for next week or what is the next project that we're going to do, whether that project be cleaning up a river, planting trees, uh, establishing a neighborhood watch, whatever, whatever, if you can discuss and plan and uh, book it in person, then you need to do you need to do it in person. If it's not possible, then you can use other means like, for example, a WhatsApp group or whatever. What, but the, the important thing is you always need to prioritize the real over the digital. Always prioritize an in-person conversation and an in-person agenda setting mission, uh, agenda se uh, setting meeting rather than doing it uh, over uh, the internet or in a group chat or whatever. If, if that's not possible, then you can use other electronic means to, to do it. But always prioritize the real uh, over the digital, even if it's a, a little more difficult, takes more time, maybe takes uh, some time. We have to drive to a location or you have to uh, take some time not to sit in the comfort of your own home. You have to get dressed and get showered. If that's what it takes, then then yes, it's it's absolutely it, it, it brings so much more positive results if you make plans and uh uh, organize in person than over the, the internet or in a in a group group chat uh, setting. So that would be my simple advice in regards to communication is always prioritize the real uh, over the virtual. Now, when it comes to scheduling, uh, mm. a handful of people just getting started to build something real. When it comes to to how often you should do things together, do you think that there is some suggestions of don't do it, don't do more than than once a month because you're a small number of people that still have to work and take care of family? Or do you think that the schedule should be applicable to the time the people are able to give? Or do you think doing too much too fast makes people burn out? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Again, start within what you can achieve within your capacity. If you, for example, and this is very, very small what you can do. If you can do one initiative in in an entire year, you're already doing more than 99% of what people out there in your community are doing. So you don't even, if, if that's the only thing that's possible, if you can only organize once a year to do something, that's already better than doing nothing. But uh, you shouldn't stop there. So you should start off with what is the most frequent that we can meet within our capacity currently. Let's say once every three months, that's when everyone can find a, a day that you've identified to do your project, whatever that project might be or that initiative might be. Once you've, you're doing that consistently, every three months you're doing it consistently, then you can set a new challenge and say, we're going to do this every two months now instead of every three months. Then you're getting a lot more done. Then once you're doing two months, every two months consistently, then you can start thinking, let's do this every month. And you do that consistently. You're going to find a nice rhythm where it's going to have to be adapted to your own personal circumstances. There's no Goldilocks zone or perfect mathematical model for how frequently you should attempt projects and initiatives. Rather, start with what is definitely possible, uh, a schedule that you definitely consistently can do. 
consistently doing th something every five months is better than doing something inconsistently every month. That's the, okay. the type of approach that you need to take. Okay, so consistency and mm. organization is better than disorganized frequency, mm. basically. Yes, so if, exactly. If, if you're building an identity, uh, if you're building, I'm sorry, a group around an, identi an identified goal or goals, you think that mm. it's better to do less frequent things that are more highly organized than trying to do less organized, more frequent things. Yeah, what you're actually, what you're doing is you're, you're creating a little proto tradition. So you're saying whatever your, let's say your organization is called the, the community cleanup forum or whatever. And you know, every six months, me and my colleague or me and my allies, me and my teammates, we get together every five months, we know everyone's there we already in advance make sure that our calendars and our schedules are open because we know every five months or every four months as is tradition but you don't call it that you're creating almost like a proto tradition tradition is okay. just uh, patterns of behavior that uh, create order and create prosperity so you create a pattern and a pattern can only emerge through consistency so you okay. consist and, that, and that's whatever why i like to have my, uh, my annual events here my, my picnic that i have at a beautiful lakeside mm. park and my uh, wilderness exactly. camping trip, I have them the same time each year, same time in the spring for the picnic, same time in the fall to enjoy the changing of the leaves. And I invite people here and I'm hoping, hoping that I can build that as a tradition and it will grow from there and good things will come of it. So that's what you're talking about here. Yes. Okay. Uh, exactly what you're talking about there is like I said, think about it like a tradition. If let's say for argument's sake, your uh, your picnic happens every February of every year. That's that's a tradition that you're creating a little small institution of uh, every year we know in February this time we have this event. Okay. Same with organizations getting together. For example, every three months we know me and my allies get together and we do this project. Like I said, you use the logic of a tradition. You're creating a little proto tradition of your of your own, and later it just starts happening naturally without you even thinking about it. Okay, okay. Then uh, the next thing I'd like to talk to you about is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, building things legally. Now, hmm. this is an unfortunate thing that we all have to deal with, and I don't mean criminal. I mean being hmm. a legal organization, right? Um, when it comes time to affect change once you get larger. Now, most of us listening probably won't get to this level, but Afro Forum clearly is a large organization. They have lots of people doing lots of things across many areas. Now, before you even get to that stage, you have to be legally, uh, legally identified. So when it comes to being a legal organization, that is going to have credentials and is going to be able to legally take donations and spread that money around and, and make fundraisers and do that kind of thing. At the beginning of creating an organization, is there a structure that you think is, that you would recommend? Like you want to have one president and three underlings to create a, a pyramid structure of, of order at the very beginning that doesn't vary later, or should it be done by committee? Like how do you recommend when people actually have an organization worth ratifying, mm. what documents and structure would you recommend for mm. officializing a small structured organization? Right. Well, firstly, that's going to depend on uh, country to country. Every country has its own uh, bureaucratic and administrative uh, hoops that you have to jump through. Unfortunately, here, in, well, unfortunately for you, fortunately for us here in South Africa, we have a deteriorating state. So we have yeah. an increasing amount of room to move in where even if the state wanted to restrict some type of organization, it's increasingly difficult for the state to do that. Uh, like I said, it might sound strange, but uh, the, the deteriorating state is actually very, in some ex to some extent, very favorable to alternative forms of uh, creating order where you Agreed. are not so lucky uh, in the U.S. You can still get nailed on a technicality, unfortunately, but that doesn't mean that you should be discouraged. That just means you have to uh, work within your context. So what you're talking about there, the structure of the organization, my best advice, I mean, I wasn't uh, one of the founders of AfriForum, but as I understand the foundation of organizations, mm -hmm. firstly, what's going to be important is you shouldn't be sweating the the, the technical stuff. You shouldn't be from day one, we need to have, uh, for argument's sake, a constitution and a, a leadership uh, structure and everything. That's not so okay. important. What's important from the beginning 
is first to get the mass, to get people together, to get people organized. But there doesn't have to be a leadership structure from the beginning. That's okay. going to come naturally as your organization or movement grows. People are going to come to the fore that naturally you identify as leaders or people that have more organizational skills than others. Others are going to be clear just followers or doers rather than leaders. And then from as your organization takes shape, you can organically start building your structure, the, the leadership structure of your organization, according to the types of people that you have to work with. So okay. I would say you would, uh, you'd actually be strangling yourself if you, from the beginning, are operating by a strict, this is how the organization is going to be structured, this is how our leadership is going to work, this is what the hierarchy of decision making is going to be. Because you don't know what type of people are going to volunteer. First, see what types of people you attract and what type of people are willing to take part consistently within your movement. And then you slowly start organically building a, a hierarchy or a decision-making structure within that based on the types of people that you have to work with. And that, okay. like I said, uh, with, with emphasis on organic. If you, from the beginning, make it too artificial, you're going to strangle yourself or you get, you're going to limit yourself and you're not going to be dynamic. Dynamic. Okay, great advice. Thank you very much. Um, when it comes, th this is my last question, by the way, then we're going to move mm -hmm. to uh, uh, at the end of all of my uh, interviews, I always like to at, have my guest ask me any question or, or, sure. or anything that's on their mind. But I do have one more thing to ask you. And that is go that is along the lines of finances, money and resources we all need for everything. Mm -hmm. When it comes to doing things like filling potholes, planting mm. trees, little things that might only cost a few dollars that a handful of people can easily get together. That's different than once you get larger and you actually start attracting people that might want to just throw money at you in hopes that you'll use it wisely. When it comes to gathering resources and using the resources in your little group that you've built, can you give us some advice on number one, how to handle those kind of donations and how to sit on the money. And number two, mm. how those resources should be spent by a small group. Hmm. So firstly, I think this is again a, a little hint that I'm taking from more leftist organizations. And that is uh -huh. there always needs to be a treasurer or someone who is in charge of managing funds. It can't just be a free for all where everyone can just put their hand in the jar and take some money and throw it at a project. There needs to be uh, at least at least one, but probably more than one, one or two people that are charged with you are in charge of managing funds and it should be someone that you trust and someone that definitely is, uh, it's probably the most trusted position within the organization just, uh, just outside of the leader. So it's probably the, the second most important position within the organization is the person that manages the bank uh, the bank account or the fund or whatever where the money is pooled. Mm -hmm. And that's very important. So you can't just have a free-for-all where we democratically vote every time we meet on what we're going to, uh, spend money on. There needs to be someone managing that money and uh, uh, that's tr uh, in charge of specifically that uh, that responsibility. As you grow, it's also going to be important uh, the sources of your of your income. Uh, I'm going to say something counterintuitive to many people within the broader uh, conservative sphere, and that is be very maybe not be very wary of single points of funding. We don't be aiming that one big billionaire or one rich person within your community is going to come fund your your project that's very dangerous because if your money your money is coming from one or two sources those people can close the tap anytime they want and they pretty much got your got your organization's balls and advice yeah. so that's not an ideal place to be rather where you want to be from where your funding comes from is what AfriForum's model is. And that is a diversified uh, stream of funds coming in from, from in our case, 310,000 members, but and not from one billionaire or from a handful of very big donors, but rather okay. from a myriad of people giving a little bit. I mean, Flip Base, the head of the solidarity, or the chair, chairperson of the solidarity movement, calls it the principle of making small money, turning small money into big money. And that's a very sustainable way of funding an organization or a movement because then nobody, no one individual or one uh, oligarchy of individuals can really steer that, or that organization in a direction that it shouldn't be in or corrupt the organization on a whim. It should rather be that money should be coming from a, 
decentralized uh, sources from all of, from a wide range of people L rather be funded by a hundred people that all that together give a thousand dollars than one person giving you two thousand dollars because that one person giving you the two thousand dollars is going to have a massive say and manipulative power over your organization and you're not going to have a choice right okay that's good advice thank you uh, when it comes to the the other pieces of an organization, even if it's only 15 or 20 people. Um, is there any final advice you would have before we move to the last part uh, mm. about all of the things we talked about today? Is there anything mm. that you think I might uh, missed? Maybe there's an important thing that came into your mind that, that, you, that you want people to know for making small uh, grassroots organizations? Mm. Be very careful of buying into conspiracy theories that paint your opponents as gods that's that then it's over then there's nothing you can do if you believe that your opponents are pretty much gods in human form that can just subvert any organization destroy anything that you build uh infiltrate any project that you have you've already lost they don't even have to do it in that case because everyone everyone's going to be too scared to even organize if that's the type of narrative that you have you need to be able to firstly know that your opponents bleed they're not gods and secondly, <laughs> that uh, what you build, there's always going to be a risk that whatever you build is destroyed or infiltrated or subverted. That's always a risk. But you're going to have to be brave enough to take that risk because your ancestors took that risk throughout, the, throughout history. And uh, if you think, if you already believe that your opponents are so powerful that whatever you attempt will be destroyed by them eventually, then what's the point? Then nothing you try will work. And then that's exactly how they keep you exactly where you, where they want you is by believing that they're gods, that believing that that's, they are pretty much all powerful and they can destroy and manipulate anything that you try. That's a, a absolutely a debilitating uh, mindset and you should guard against it at all costs. I absolutely 100% agree with that. And I say that often to the people uh, in my circles as well. So we, we are on the same page there. That's wonderful advice. Take what Ernst said to heart. It, it, it matters. We, we cannot let them defeat us internally in our heart and spirit, because if that's the case, then they've already won. They've beaten you on the inside and you can't let them do that. Like we have to have a, a positive moral outlook and we can't let the fire in us be blown out. Only we can choose to let that go out. And I know it's hard mm -hmm. sometimes, but uh, we, but if we keep that fire going and we keep pushing, then uh, then we can build great things together. So mm -hmm. uh, Ernst, uh, we have, we're almost at the end of the interview here. And as always, uh, is there anything you would like to ask me or is there anything you're curious mm -hmm. about that you would like to talk about here at the end of the stream? My question is very simple because I think this is also your answer might contain something that's very important to you, what you're trying to achieve as well. And that is what gives you hope for your community? What, what do you see around you? What do you identify around you that gives you hope for the future? What gives you a, a white pill? What gives me a white pill is in my, in my county, uh, in, in America, states are divvied up by counties. You probably know that. Uh, in my county and the neighboring two counties, homeschool numbers are up 600%. Um, also, firearm ownership and first-time firearm owners is up about 80%. So that, that's a big change in just the last couple of years. And that I know that that's not a personal thing, but around here in Appalachia, people are very private. They keep to themselves and don't like to mess around in other people's business. And so most of my communication is only with one church, my mother's church, and the handful of families that I'm personally friends with. And because uh, I don't live near a big city or anything, so I don't go out and, and talk to dozens and hundreds of people every day like some people do in, in, in bigger metro areas. But the thing that gives me a white pill is not only do I see people around me or hear people, I should say, around me talking about, man, I can't believe how this is anti-white and this is anti-Christian and this is anti-male. I'm just so sick of this. I got to do something about it. I hear parents. I hear parents that I know personally saying, oh, there's no way I'd ever send my daughter to university. No way. I'm going to teach her right. We're going to raise her at home. We're going to homeschool or community school or send her to a private Christian school, that kind of thing. I hear that talk around me a lot more now than I ever have. 
And that, that gives me a white pill that people, even though around here, most people are pretty comfortable and ignorant to the, the larger darkness going on. They're starting to notice that, Hey, a lot of this stuff like social media and cartoons and children's books and things, they've just become so negative and hateful of my child. I got to do something about it. And that gives me hope. So uh, that, that is my white pill uh, as a, uh, a local anecdote there, Ernst. So uh, hmm. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. No, exactly. No, um, I'm very glad. And I asked that question specifically because everyone just talks about uh, what what's making me uh, what's making me hopeless for the future? What's making me angry? What's frustrating me? And people need to start. There are things that give you hope. There are things that give you strength for the future. And we need to start talking about them. Well, we have come to the end of the stream. So now it is time to check the community engagement and see what questions and comments you might have for me and my guests today uh, uh, after our conversation. We're going to start over on PayPal. Uh, over on PayPal, we have a... Uh, for 10 Australian dollary dues. So uh, thank you for the money from down under. Uh, we have, let me make sure I'm not going to, to dox his, his full name because PayPal sometimes shows you uh, shows me the, the, the full real name. Uh, and it does this time. So we're just going to say a man named Stuart. Uh, I'm not going to say his last name. Uh, Stuart from Australia says, a small contribution from Australia for you. Oh, for your spring meetup. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, he says, obviously, I live in Australia, so won't be able to attend, but I appreciate what you do. Thank you. And he says to uh, identify him publicly as Moby7. So thank you, Moby7, for the Australian dollary dues. I do appreciate it. And that's, it. A, that's a, a little bit of uh, money that you can put in the jar. You put mm -hmm. that in the fund. I mean, that's already mm -hmm. a step in the right direction. You're not going to go spend that money now on booze or on cigarettes or whatever. You go just put it in a safe place and it goes to the right place. And that's that's all that really matters. Indeed. Uh, over on Odyssey, we wow. Oh, my goodness. Um, there's no message with this at all. It's just and, 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 uh, from Paladin, from user Paladin, 100 US dollars for the spring meetup. Wow. Uh, thank you, Paladin. Uh, you basically covered half the budget for the entire picnic right there because I usually spend around $200, like I said on my uh, on my morning walk video last week, getting all the meat and fixings and, and vegetables and things. for Because uh, uh, Ernst, uh, for my picnics, I create bacon-wrapped pork chops. I make burgers. I get steak. I get steak tips and make beef kebabs. I like having a lot of food to feed people, uh, and I just like mm. to grill all day when they come. So I like to have a big food budget because I love to cook for people. So uh, mm. that guy right there, uh, assuming it's a guy, uh, that guy right there named Paladin just covered half the food budget for the uh, for the spring meetup. Thank you so nice. much. That's uh, that's incredible. Uh, over on Entropy, we don't have anything right now. Uh, over on Rumble, we have a five U.S. dollar Rumble chat from Dan Caslaw. Thank you, Dan. I see you around the way a lot. Thank you for stopping by to to, to give me some of your uh, of your money. I deeply appreciate that. Uh, he gives a little 07 salute, and he says salute for Ernst and all the excellent advice. Thank you. So that one's for you, Ernst. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, we don't have any other uh, paid messages or questions for you today. So I believe we'll wrap that up there. Uh, I think this was a great conversation. I hope that listening to Ernst and I speak inspires you out there to take action like we're talking about. All it takes is you and one other person to get together and start going to PTA meetings. Go to your church. Go to your family meetings. Go to your gun club. Especially the boring club. ones because that's if you don't go to them, the leftists are going to take them over. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we have to do... Uh, a long march of our own. It won't be the same, but we still have to do the the the, the dirty, boring work to get to, to take back what's rightfully right. ours. So, uh, thank you so much for being here. I love uh, uh, your uh, weekly streams on either Monday or Tuesdays are are great for me because that's when I'm doing my my news gathering and my uh, my content mm. work. So it's a wonderful thing I get to have on while I work every week. Mm. Uh, you can find Ernst Van Ziel. We'll go ahead and shill for you here at the end. I'm going to share your link in the chat and tell people to come sub to you. Take just a minute before we leave and tell people what they can expect on your channel. 
Mm. Well, thank you very much for the endorsement. Uh, my channel is specifically focused on Africa and South Africa, but all the topics that I cover, I use Africa and South Africa as the, as the scenery, but it's all uh, relevant to other countries in Europe, America, everywhere. Um, so every Tuesday, uh, 7 o'clock Central Africa time, um, the, the, the time in the U.S. keeps shifting because you've got these wacky daylight savings, whatever. Oh, it's so silly. Our time I don't just like stays, it <laughs> In Africa, time just stays the same. <laughs> so um, every uh, you can just check uh, what that time is wherever you live. Seven o'clock Central Africa time. I have a live guest or I, it's just me and I talk about specifically solutions for the future. I don't really do current events. Uh, I focus more on talking about ideas that last, things that will still be relevant in five, 10 years from now. And uh, it also makes sure that if you can't catch that episode live on the Tuesday, you can still watch it even a month later and it will still be just as relevant. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, uh, the last uh, or second last thing I'd like to show is uh, if you are living abroad and you want to support Afri Forum, you can't become a member. You have to be live in South Africa to become a member, but you can be a supporter by going to Friends of Afri Forum. You just type in Friends of Afri Forum and uh, you can uh, become a, a, a donating supporter of Afri Forum and everything we do, all our state proof solutions over here, creating a reality. And then lastly, uh, go watch my documentary called Self Bestir. Um, might be a bit difficult to spell. So that's uh, S E L F. B E S T W U, so U U, and then R, self bestir, and uh, it does have English subtitles. So it has an Afrikaans title, and the language that it is, is in is Afrikaans, but it has English, perfect English subtitles that we painstakingly put in. So uh, it's on YouTube, it's on AfriForum's YouTube channel. So go check it out. It's all about explaining our uh, solutions for the future and nothing is secret from what we do we spell it out we make documentaries about what we do and how we want going to, how we're going to do it so if you haven't watched it yet and you're curious about what we do go check it out it's doing very well so far it's been endorsed by amazing people and it's also been watched by amazing people so i'm very fortunate so and just <laughs> oh yeah thank you very much yeah you've done both you've watched and uh, uh supported uh, watched and uh, promoted it um and i'm very glad for that so yeah that would be the last I, thing i love that, listening uh... to the afrikaans language it's just beautiful <laughs> i like listening to it and, and he's right about the subtitles i haven't watched the whole thing but i've watched about the first half hour and the subtitles are excellent in english i had no problem at all understanding it so hmm. ernst hopefully one day down the road we can we can celebrate together because we will have something like Afroform here in Appalachia mm -hmm. and I can celebrate it with you and know that you contributed to what we're building here. So the most important thing, keep heart, everyone. Keep heart and take responsible, positive action in your life. And we can do this together. Uh, the future may look dark, but we can take the light to it. So with that yeah. being said, uh, thank you, Ernst, for being here, and uh, may, and I look forward to seeing you on your channel. I'd like to visit you, and maybe mm. uh, you'll even come back again one day, and we can talk mm. again. So thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely, and uh, my last word would be very, be, be always uh, on the lookout and be careful for the idolaters of the act. Absolutely. Uh, I will. I have a long trip to make this week. I'm traveling halfway across the country for a function, but I'll be back Monday night for more Discordant Dragons. Have a blessed weekend, everyone. Keep heart, and God bless.